Jose. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu flat out rejects the United States push for a statehood of Palestine, putting relations between the two nations at risk. Says victory against Palestine is the only way. Pushing back. Former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley doubles down on her rhetoric against Trump as New Hampshire looms. Trump says his pending victory will tell everyone that he's indeed the Republican nominee. Shine forever. South Korea hosts the Youth Olympics with five new countries joining the Youth Games, making it the highest participated Youth Olympic event in history. And back from the dead. A woman in Oregon got the shock of her life, but it ends on a happy note. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Turkey joins a selective group of countries that have conquered space travel. Well, that story is coming up, but first, let's take you to Israel, where Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that he has told the United States that he opposes the establishment of a Palestinian state once the conflict in Gaza comes to an end. In a news conference, a defiant Netanyahu vowed to press on with the offensive in Gaza until complete victory. The destruction of Hamas and returning uh, of the remaining Israeli hostages, adding that it could take many more months. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Washington in a press conference that he objected to any Palestinian statehood that did not guarantee Israel's security. He added that the lack of Palestinian statehood had not stood in the way of normalization agreements with Arab states a few years ago and that he still intended to add more countries to those accords. Israel and its biggest backer, the United States, appear at odds now, with Netanyahu and his right-wing coalition government largely rejecting the establishment of a Palestinian state, even though Washington maintains that the two-state solution is the only feasible way to bring lasting peace to the region. The latest episode of hostilities in the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict started when Hamas militants stormed into southern Israel on October 7th, killing 1,200 people and taking 240 hostages. Israel says more than 130 still remain in captivity. Well, we have some breaking news now. The AFP news agency is reporting that Pakistan's Prime Minister held an emergency security meeting today with military and intelligence chiefs after trading uh, deadly airstrikes with Iran on militant targets this week. The meeting focused on how the Pakistan military carries out further attacks against targets in Iran and whether the military wants to continue another conflict with the nation's western border. Now, this comes after Pakistan uh, halted diplomatic ties with Tehran yesterday by recalling its ambassador and barring the Iranian ambassador from entering the country. Meanwhile, the leader of Yemen's Houthi militia declared on Thursday that a direct clash with the United States would only strengthen the group and vow to continue attacking ships in the Red Sea. The Houthi have always uh, emerged stronger from confrontation with their enemies. The militia leader Abdul Malik Al Houthi said in a televised speech a day after the US military carried out airstrikes on Houthi military sites for the fourth time in a week. The U.S. military attacked targets in Yemen again. More strikes in retaliation for attacks by militants known as the Houthis on commercial and military ships in the Red Sea. The Houthis say they are attacking the ships to support Gaza by blocking supplies from reaching Israel. The Biden administration on Wednesday formally redesignated the Houthis as a terrorist organization. They'd been added to the list under President Trump, taken off, and are now back on the designation taking effect in a month. But it's not just the Houthis and the Red Sea. War is spreading across the Middle East, with the U.S. at the center of it. The United States is now in an increasingly open and expanding conflict with what is known as the Axis of Resistance, a network of militant groups in six countries and territories. All are backed by Iran, but they operate with a degree of autonomy. The war escalated when Hamas attacked Israel in October 
and Israel responded with devastating force, backed by the United States politically and with weapons. Collectively, the Iranian-led axis is formidable. Hezbollah in Lebanon is arguably the most powerful non-state military in the world, with tens of thousands of rockets and battle-tested fighters. Hamas has effective militants too, and the notoriety of the Palestinian cause. Iranian-backed militias in Syria and Iraq are close to oil fields and American military bases, which they've been attacking and been attacked from consistently since October. And in Yemen, the Houthis, they call themselves Ansarullah, have the advantage of location right on the Red Sea. Well, at least 12 school children in the age group of 10 to 13 years and two teachers died after a board overturned in Hardy Lake of Gujarat during a school picnic. A first information report was filed against 18 people in connection with the incident, including employees of the company running the boating facility and the board operator, while three have been arrested so far. Dozens of pupils and two teachers drowned in the incident which took place in Harney Lake in the Vadodara city. Police have arrested two people in connection with the incident. Search operations are underway to find the remaining victims. 18 students and two teachers have been rescued so far and are undergoing treatment in a nearby hospital. While the cause of the incident is not yet known, eyewitnesses say that the boat was packed beyond its capacity of 14 passengers. The tragic incident has made national headlines and many parents have accused authorities of jeopardizing their children's lives by flouting safety norms. Federal Minister Harsh Sangavi said that only 10 students on the boat were wearing a life jacket, which means that a majority of the passengers were without one. Some parents have alleged that they were not informed about the boat ride and the incident. Some guardians stated that the school had informed that the students were going to be taken to a water park but then took them to a lake instead. Well, the latest on the U.S. presidential election coming right up after this break. You're watching World News Tonight. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to World News. Now Nikki Haley says that her goal in New Hampshire's Republican presidential primary on Tuesday is to be strong. But the one-time South Carolina governor stopped short of saying she needs to defeat former President Donald Trump in the Granite State primary next week. Thanks so much, Chris. Tonight, Nikki Haley doubling down on this controversial remark about the history of race in America. On the campaign trail today, Haley addressing the criticism head on, turning to a regular part of her stump speech for cover. You said the other day that we have never been a racist country. Uh, do you, was that a slip of the tongue? No. Listen, I was born a brown girl in a small rural town in South Carolina. If my parents never wanted us to think we lived in a racist country, did we face racism? Yes. It's the latest in a series of campaign stumbles on race from Haley as she rises in the polls. Last month, the former South Carolina governor faced fierce backlash for failing to mention slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you can answer my question. Thank you. Next question. That firestorm and the flurry of clarifications that followed, the possible driver of a temporary, if critical, adjustment on the trail, limited Q&As with voters, and near zero questions from her traveling press corps. Choices that drew rebukes from Haley's GOP rival, Ron DeSantis. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question. No, no, I'm going to do some more. Don't worry. How many is that? Like four or five? I got to do more than that. That'll equal the number that Haley and Trump do in a month. But today, Haley reversing course, answering questions from voters for the first time since Monday's Iowa caucus and facing her first reporter gaggle in weeks. Days from the New Hampshire primary, Haley 14 points behind her former boss, Donald Trump even as some polls had them neck and neck here in notoriously hard to poll New Hampshire. Despite fluid polling and Ron DeSantis still in the running, her campaign framing this race as a one-on-one -on -one with Trump. Haley, though, continuing to temper her direct criticisms of the front runner. I'm gonna beat him so we don't have to ever deal with, are we gonna elect a convicted felon? Now, as Haley prepares for the Granite State to pose the biggest test of her candidacy yet, questions about if she has what it takes to pass it with flying colors or at all. 
Well, despite his opponents uh, campaigning hard to win in New Hampshire primary, former U.S. President Donald Trump is busy sharing his time between New York and the Granite State. On the second day of his trial against uh, writer Jean Carroll, Trump's lawyers managed to cross-examine the accuser and showcase how Donald Trump had been wrongfully convicted. E. Jean Carroll, the writer seeking millions of dollars from Donald Trump for defamation, yeah rejected suggestions in her testimony on Thursday that her reputation has been enhanced since she accused the former U.S. president of rape. Under questioning from Trump's lawyer in a Manhattan courtroom, Carol acknowledged receiving more attention from media and celebrities since publicizing her rape claim in June 2019, but said she's also been widely disparaged. I am more well known and I am hated by a lot more people, she said. Carol is seeking at least $10 million from Trump for two statements he made as president, in which he denied assaulting her in the mid-1990s in a department store dressing room and said she made up the claim to promote her memoir. Trump's lawyer Alina Habba argued the writer has leveraged her claim into newfound fame as an advocate for women. U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan has already ruled that Trump sexually abused Carol by forcing his fingers into her vagina and that he defamed her in June 2019. The nine-person jury need decide only how much Trump should pay Carol in damages. Following Carol's testimony, a damages expert told jurors on her behalf it would cost from $7.3 million to $12.1 million to repair damage that Trump's denials did to Carol's reputation. Trump had been in the courtroom on Tuesday and Wednesday, but was not there on Thursday, so he could attend his mother-in-law's funeral in Florida. The judge threatened to kick him out of court on Wednesday after he was overheard criticizing Carol's testimony. He could testify next week. Well, Japan doubled the fund used for disaster relief and other contingencies to 1 trillion yen as no worsened conditions for survivors of the earthquake. Now, the 7.5 magnitude quake and powerful aftershocks killed at least 222 people uh, in the Ishikawa prefecture, laying ways to houses and infrastructure. Japanese officials are urging people to remain vigilant for quakes of upper five or stronger for the next two or three weeks. Now, following that story for us tonight is uh, other learners, Prithvi Soiza, who joins me now from Tokyo. Prithvi. The situation in central Japan's north of Peninsula remains severe more than two weeks after a devastating earthquake and tsunami. Cold weather is expected on Friday in the devastated area, and there are concerns that this could pose health risks to the survivors. Shikawa Prefectural Government official says 232 people have been confirmed dead in the prefecture. Small businesses in Ishikawa have also been affected. Satellite imagery of the area before and after the quake shows that the intense uplift extends the coastline by up to 820 feet. Images of Japan's north of Peninsula show coastal area where the sea flow has risen above the water, creating newly exposed beaches. The coastline changes after the earthquake and tsunami had already subsided leaving some ports completely dry and inaccessible to boats. Absolutely. Uh, Prutuvi Soviz Adha Dirana World News Special Correspondent reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Thank you. A SpaceX X rocket took off for the International Space Station on another trailblazing mission operated entirely by the private sector. On board is a group of European astronauts, including the first person from Turkey to visit outer space. The mission is the latest in a series of endeavors from the private sector bolstered by NASA that aims to churn up business activity in Earth's orbit. Turkey's first astronaut and three other crew members representing Europe were launched from Florida on a voyage to the International Space Station in the latest commercially arranged mission from Texas startup Axiom Space. A SpaceX crew Dragon capsule carrying the Axiom quarter lifted off about an hour before sunset from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, beginning a planned 36-hour flight to the orbiting laboratory. Live video streamed online by Axiom showed the two-stage 25-story tall launch vehicle streaking into party cloudy skies over Florida's Atlantic coast atop a fiery yellowish tail of exhaust. Cameras inside the crew compartment beam footage of four men strapped into their pressurized cabin seated calmly in helmeted white and black flight suits as the rocket soared towards space. 
the rocket's reusable lower stage had been detached from the rest of the spacecraft, flew itself back to the Earth and safely touched down on a landing zone near the launch site. The mission was the third such flight organized by Houston-based Axiom over the past two years as the company builds on its business of putting astronauts sponsored by foreign governments and private enterprise into Earth orbit. Now, the fourth uh, Winter Youth Olympic Games kicked off with the opening ceremony in South Korea's eastern Gangwon province. About 1,900 athletes aged uh, 14 to 18 from some 80 countries and regions are participating in the Games to compete in four cities of the province throughout February 1st under the slogan of Grow Together, Shine Forever. South Korea became the first host of the Winter Youth Olympics outside of Europe. Now, the number of young athletes participating in the Winter Olympics uh, hit a record high as Algeria, Nigeria, Puerto Rico, Tunisia and the United Arab Emirates made their Winter Youth Olympic debut. A total of 15 disciplines across uh, seven uh, sports will be on display during the two-week sporting event. Apparently a man came back from the dead. That story right after this commercial break. You're watching World News Tonight. Welcome back everyone to World News. Now in some uplifting news, Sydney Airport and Guide Dogs uh, Sydney hosted a one day only pop-up puppy cafe at Cafe Valence in Sydney's airport's uh, domestic terminal too. Now the event was aimed to provide a delightful experience for travellers and raise awareness about the incredible work of Guide Dogs. These scrimmaging balls of fur may look like a corral of Labrador pup cuteness, but there is important work ahead of them, guiding the visually impaired through life. Sydney Airport today throwing its support behind guide dogs, setting up a pup pop-up cafe in T2 as part of an airport-wide fundraiser. The organisation also taking the opportunity to show their work with therapy dogs. The airport tossing in $50,000, funding two years worth of training and care for one guide dog ready to go. And these pups will carry names anchored in aviation. Aero, Pax, Sid and Amelia. The only aviating Amelia I knew was Earhart. Now, Christopher Nolan's uh, Oppenheimer leads this year's BAFTA Film Awards nomination with a total of 13 nods. They included uh, one for Cillian Murphy for playing uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the theoretical uh, physicist uh, described as the father of the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer's uh, summer box of his rival, Barbie, received five nominations, a level with the cult hit drama Saltburn. Elsewhere, Poor Things uh, has 18 nod 11 nods, rather, while Killers of the Flower Moon and The Zone of Interest both have nine. Well, it's rare that we hear anyone coming back from the dead, but that's exactly what a woman in Oregon experienced. An Oregon woman was shocked when she received a call that her cousin's body had been found. But she got an even bigger shock months later when that cousin called her to say he was alive. Latasha Rosales had lost touch with her cousin, Tyler Chase, who she says struggles with addiction. Officials from the city of Portland notified her that they found Tyler's temporary ID card on a deceased person whom they presumed to have died of a fentanyl overdose. She says she was even given his ashes and put them in an urn in her home. Latasha says that's how long it took the medical examiner's office to realize its mistake and call her with the good news that Tyler was in fact very much alive and living in a rehabilitation center. The medical examiner's office has publicly admitted and apologized for the error. It also says it will make changes to its identification process, so a mistake like this never happens again. While Latasha says she's still upset about the mix-up, she's so grateful to have Tyler back in her life. Well, the last person who came back uh, from the dead was around 2,000, over 2,000 years old, and he kind of had a, a whole religion to him. Who knows, Tyler might have his own. 
Well, that's a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining us for this entire week. Have a joyful weekend. I'll be back again next week at the same time with Monday's edition of World News. And before that, I'll see you uh, on Get Fear at 7. See you then. Bye for now.